Good afternoon, everyone. Let us sing number seven on page eight. Beloved, mighty I am presence from the heart of God in the great central sun, O mighty threefold flame of life, O holy Christ self, intensify thy light within us, expand the great spheres of light round about us. Beloved Archangel Michael and seven archangels, come forth in this hour, come forth to cut us free. Place your mighty electronic presence with us upon this altar, in this room. Cut free souls of light to be present with us in this hour. I call to all the hosts of heaven to cut free the souls of light and bring them into the knowledge of their own mighty I Am presence. Therefore, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and the Divine Mother, we consecrate these souls to their immortal victory in the light. In the name of Jesus Christ, Amen. We would like to sing to the seven archangels to welcome them to our midst. Since this song isn't in this booklet, you may sing it because you know it or listen to it and make your calls out loud during the singing for the angels to come to Los Angeles to liberate all souls of light for this victory. Michael, Michael, Michael,
Thank you. Won't you be seated? The Phoenix Mystery, Karma and Reincarnation. How many know what a phoenix is? Can you describe him? Do you know what colors are his feathers? I thought I'd better tell you about the phoenix so that we could understand his mystery. The phoenix is a mythical bird that figures in the legends of East and West. It is an ancient symbol of rebirth, rejuvenation, and immortality. One of the earliest accounts of the phoenix describes him as being about the size of an eagle with plumage that is part gold and part crimson. Other accounts say he has brilliant purple feathers with a gold collar. The first trace of the phoenix legend appears in about 430 BC. Herodotus' account of Egypt gives us the explanation. For it was in Egypt that he was shown pictures of the bird. In ancient Egypt, the phoenix was called a Bennu. The Bennu was the hieroglyph for the rising sun. The words Bennu and phoenix are said to mean variously palm tree, purple red, or crimson. There are several variations of the phoenix legend. The first century church father, Clement of Rome, once wrote an account of the phoenix calling it that wonderful sign which takes place in eastern lands, that is, in Arabia and the countries round about. This is the legend as he related it. There is a certain bird which is called a phoenix. This is the only one of its kind. It lives 500 years. And when the time of its dissolution draws near that it must die, it builds itself a nest of frankincense and myrrh and other spices, into which, when the time is fulfilled, it enters and dies. But as the flesh decays, a certain kind of worm is produced, which, being nourished by the juices of the dead bird, brings forth feathers. Then, when it has acquired strength, it takes up that nest in which are the bones of its parent, and bearing these, it passes from the land of Arabia into Egypt, into the city called Heliopolis. And in open day, flying in the sight of all men, it places them on the altar of the sun, and having done this, hastens back to its former abode. The priests then inspect the registers of the dates and find that it has returned exactly as the 500th year was completed. Later versions of the legend say that when the phoenix is finished making its nest, the rays of the sun ignite the nest. The bird is consumed by the fire. Out of the ashes of the dead phoenix arises the worm that becomes the new phoenix. Other variations of the story say the bird ignites the fire by fanning its wings. According to Professor R. T. Rundle Clark, the real significance of the phoenix, or Bennu, has been reduced to a fairy tale by those who were unfamiliar with the inner meaning of Egyptian religion. In reality, the phoenix was the principle of life, the symbol of divine power in manifestation. It was the initiator of a new age and the determiner of destiny. The phoenix embodies the original logos, the word or declaration of destiny which mediates between the divine mind and created things. It is essentially an aspect of God, self-created. It is the first and deepest manifestation of the soul of the high God. In a sense, when the phoenix gave out the primeval call, it initiated all cycles of time. As the herald of each new dispensation, it becomes optimistically the harbinger of good tidings. During the Middle Kingdom, the Bennu bird became the symbol for the planet Venus, the morning star which precedes the sun out of the underworld and is the herald of a new day. In spite of these minor roles, however, the Bennu bird continues to be he who created himself, a form of the high God. 
Clark says the phoenix also figures in Egyptian religion as the chief messenger from the inaccessible land of divinity. The phoenix came from the faraway world of eternal life, bringing the message of light and life to a world wrapped in the helplessness of the primeval night. Its flight is the width of the world, over oceans, seas, and rivers, to land at last in Heliopolis, the symbolic center of the earth, where it will announce the new age. The phoenix is known in Arab lore as the Anka, and in Chinese tradition as the Feng Huang. Its arrival was said to portend a great event. The word phoenix appears in some translations of Job, chapter 29, verse 18, which reads, I shall die in my nest, and I shall multiply my days as the phoenix. Early Christian writers used the story of the phoenix as an analogy for the resurrection. To the ancient alchemists, the phoenix represented regeneration, the successful fulfillment of an alchemical process, and the liberated soul. The phoenix also symbolizes cyclic destruction and recreation. On a psychological level, the phoenix has been compared to that element within us that is able to overcome the trials and traumas of life. What then is the phoenix? I liken it unto the soul. The rebirth of the phoenix out of the fiery flames portends the reincarnation of your soul. The ashes of the phoenix are the ingredients of selfhood. They are the distillation of the former self and the seeds of the new self. The ashes are the positive and negative karma you bring back with you and that portion of soul identity that has been, become endued with God. The ashes of the karmic self have a plus minus or yang yin polarity. The yang and the yin represent light and darkness. Every one of us is shaped out of the karma of our previous lifetimes. Your karma is the causes you have set in motion and the effects you will reap from those causes. In his epistle to the Galatians, the Apostle Paul set forth the law of karma taught to him by Jesus Christ. Every man shall bear his own burden. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth that shall he also reap. By the law of karma, God gave us the opportunity to learn the lessons of our sowings and our reapings, the good and the bad. Through the successive incarnations of our soul, we reap the ancient sowings. But the Phoenix mystery is more than reincarnation. It is reincarnation as a springboard to self-transcendence. Your soul's sojourn on earth, lifetime after lifetime, is intended to be an upward spiral. No, a treadmill existence is not your destiny. Hegel accurately described the phoenix as a symbol of self-transcendence when he wrote in his philosophy of religion, spirit consuming the envelope of its existence does not merely pass into another envelope, nor rise rejuvenescent from the ashes of its previous form. It comes forth exalted, glorified, a purer spirit. It certainly makes war upon itself, consumes its own existence. But in this very destruction, it works up that existence into a new form. And each successive phase becomes in its turn a material working on which it exalts itself to a new grade. In the Hindu epic, the Mahabharata, the sage Sanat Kumara also teaches that the goal of reincarnation is self-transcendence. He says, 
as a goldsmith purifies the dross of his metal by repeatedly casting it into the fire with very persistent efforts of his own. After the same manner, the soul succeeds in cleaning herself by her course through hundreds of births. Through the trials and tribulations of each lifetime, your soul is purifying the dross. She is transmuting the mutable elements of the lesser self into the immutable gold of the real self. The Phoenix mystery is you, every day, meeting the challenge of your returning karma. It is you going through the process of growth, of refinement, yes, of self-transcendence. The Apostle Paul said, I die daily. So should we be able to say, I die daily. And by this we mean, some part of my lesser self dies daily, clearing the way for a part of my higher self to appear on earth, exactly as it is already in heaven. Yes, the Phoenix mystery is the daily dying unto the soul's daily transfiguration in Christ Jesus, our Lord. As we take this lecture in levels, I would like you to enter into the levels of consciousness that we are speaking of. So I invite you to give with me, from the Heart, Head and Pan booklet, page five, the transfiguration. Together. I am changing all my garments, old ones, for the bright new day. With the sun of understanding, I am shining all the way. I am light within, without. I am light is all about. Fill me, free me, glorify me, seal me, heal me, purify me. Until transfigured they describe me. I am shining like the sun. I am shining like the sun. I am changing all my garments, old ones, for the bright new day. With the sun of understanding I am shining all the way. I am light within, without. I am light is all about. Fill me, free me, glorify me, seal me, heal me, purify me. Until transfigured they describe me. I am shining like the sun. I am shining like the sun. I am changing all my garments, old ones, for the bright new day. With the sun of understanding I am shining all the way. I am light within, without. I am light is all about. Fill me, free me, glorify me, seal me, heal me, purify me. Until transfigured they describe me. I am shining like the sun. I am shining like the sun. When we have given the proper foundation of violet flame, tube of light, calling on the law of forgiveness, and various decrees, that we understand that our souls need. And we come to this decree, we actually change in the process of giving it. We change by increments, so that when you say this decree daily, you're actually putting aside some of the old self and putting on some of the new self. Moria said the key in giving this decree is that you can never be pinpointed in time and space because you are never the same person from moment to moment. If you think about the blinking of your eyes, or the in-breath or the out-breath, you can also see these as cycles of dying daily and being reborn daily, moment by moment in eternity. The dying and the being reborn in this pattern of the phoenix is like the pendulum swinging from the yin to the yang. So in a sense of the word, when you meditate upon self and the vast microcosm that you are right now, you can see that the 500 years as the symbolical number of the phoenix coming and going can be five seconds or a fifth of a second as you go through your daily rounds. The mystery of life in this body and out of this body is stupendous. We have but to meditate and tune in upon it. Yes, the Phoenix mystery 
is the daily dying unto the soul's daily resurrection. And the resurrection is different from the transfiguration. It is a different ray and a different chakra, but it is the process of transformation. When we enter it and believe in it, we begin to see the flame of eternal life merging with this form. So let us give the next mantra, which gives us this flame. Together. I am the flame of resurrection, blazing God's pure light through me. Now I am raising every atom from every shadow. I am free. I am the light of God's full presence. I am living ever free. Now the flame of life eternal rises up to victory. I am the flame of resurrection, blazing God's pure light through me. Now I am raising every atom from every shadow. I am free. I am the light of God's full presence. I am living ever free. Now the flame of life eternal rises up to victory. I am the flame of resurrection, blazing God's pure light through me. Now I am raising every atom from every shadow. I am free. I am the light of God's full presence. I am living ever free. Now the flame of life eternal rises up to victory. And yes, the Phoenix mystery is the daily dying unto the soul's daily ascension. You are ascending every moment, every day. The ascension flame is the sacred fire in the base of the spine chakra, rising every day. And that is exactly what this decree says together. I am ascension light, victory flowing free, all of good when at last for all eternity. I am light, all weights are gone, into the air I raise. To all I pour with full God power my wondrous song of praise. All hail, I am the living Christ, the ever-loving one. Ascended now with full God power, I am a blazing sun. I am ascension light, victory flowing free. All of good, one at last for all eternity. I am light, all weights are gone, into the air I raise. To all I pour with full God power my wondrous song of praise. All hail, I am the living Christ, the ever-loving one. Ascended now with full God power, I am a blazing sun. I am ascension light, victory flowing free, all of good, one at last for all eternity. I am light, all weights are gone, into the air I raise. To all I pour with full God power my wondrous song of praise. All hail, I am the living Christ, the ever-loving one. Ascended now with full God power, I am a blazing sun. The phoenix also represents the reincarnation and karma of planet Earth, pointing to its future resurrection in a golden age. The phoenix is the soul of the planet, being purged and then reborn. The ancients taught that there is a cyclic creation, destruction, and rebirth of worlds. According to Hindu cosmology, every world creation evolves through four yugas, or ages. The first age begins in perfection. Each succeeding one decreases in length, and increases in its degradations. The Kali Yuga is the last and the worst of the four ages. It is characterized by strife, discord, and moral deterioration. The Hindus say we are now in the Kali Yuga. According to one tradition, the cycle of four ages, known as a Maha Yuga, is repeated 1,000 times to make up a Kalpa. At the end of a kalpa, there is a period of destruction or involution. All matter in the universe is absorbed into the universal spirit. This parallels the teachings of the ascended masters. In many religions, fire is associated with the end of a cycle or the last judgment. 
The fire can be scorching or rejuvenating, purging or liberating. In each case, it is transforming. The Zoroastrians believe that in the Last Judgment, mankind would have to pass through a fiery river of melted metal coming out of the mountains. A Zoroastrian text says, for him who is righteous it will seem like warm milk, and for him who is wicked it will seem as if he is walking in the flesh through molten metal. Jewish, Christian, and Gnostic sources speak of a similar fiery stream. The third century Christian theologian, Origen of Alexandria, said that Jesus would stand in a fiery river and baptize with fire those who would enter paradise. The book of Revelation prophesies that the beast, the devil, the false prophet, and other wicked ones will be cast into the lake of fire. In the third century Gnostic text, Pistis Sophia, Jesus tells his disciples that when he said, I am come to cast fire on the earth, he meant I am come to purify the sins of the whole world with fire. For the Hindus, the use of fire in cremation symbolizes the burning away of the impurities of the deceased. In Buddhism, cremation is said to liberate the soul. In the case of Gautama Buddha, his cremation is seen as the outward sign of a conflagration of soul and spirit that has already taken place on the spiritual level. He is the self-consuming flame of perfect enlightenment. He is the self-consuming flame of perfect enlightenment. You know it and I know it. We are in an age of transition. The earth is approaching the end of the Piscean Age. The Divine Mother is in travail. We are in the birthing process of the Aquarian Age. The Age of Aquarius is related to the phenomenon known in astronomy as the precession of the equinoxes. The precession of the equinoxes is the slow backward rotation of the Earth around its polar axis, during which the point of the spring equinox recedes through the signs of the zodiac. It takes about 25,800 years for the Earth to make one complete round through the 12 signs of the zodiac and approximately 2,150 years to go through 30 degrees of the zodiac or one astrological sign. Since the Earth rotates or precesses backwards, the order of the ages is also backwards. About 4,000 years ago, or 2,000 BC, we entered the age of Aries. 2,000 years ago, we entered the age of Pisces. Now we are entering the age of Aquarius. No one knows precisely when the ages begin and conclude. What we will experience in this decade of transition? This is the question we ought to ponder. We as citizens of planet Earth are passing through the birth canal. Whether we arrive at the gate to enter an age of light or an age of darkness depends on whether we have heart for the trial by fire. For the interval between ages brings the initiation of fire. The mystics have called it the trial by fire. Like the phoenix, we are destined to emerge from that fire transformed. But to fulfill this, our fiery destiny, we must meet fire with fire. Fire for fire is the name of the game, and the fire we bring to the altar of soul purification is the violet fire of Aquarius. I'd like to invite you to sing with me with the great love of your heart, the 1.30 decrees through forgiveness. <laughs>
violet flame is a gentle flame. You can drink almost unlimited portions of it and not in any way be burdened. The violet flame transmutes those substances in all levels of being that you are prepared to cast into the sacred fire. Those conditions of the human consciousness without which you can still retain your identity. Sometimes our identity is all mixed up with our karma and our psychology. And were we to attempt to cast it into the violet flame, we would not be able to do so because until we have separated out from it and seen it for what it is, we cannot simply take a hunk of our human consciousness and say, be dissolved. This is why we work. Jesus said, my father worketh hitherto, and I work. We work daily on our consciousness, our state of being, on directing the violet flame into these records, the gentle violet flame, the all-consuming, transmuting violet flame. Day by day, we create a new heaven and a new earth where we are by this violet flame. It has much to do with whether you pass through the trial by fire successfully or not. The violet flame is the pre-fire that comes to us before we must enter that all-consuming fire of God, that sacred fire in all of its white intensity. The trial by fire then, which we prepare for by the violet flame, is another word for the day of the Lord's judgment. It is the weighing of the soul for light, for darkness, accrued. It is the karmic summing up chapter by chapter of each one's book of life. Having passed through all of that, the soul will be ready to meet her Lord in his second coming. The trial by fire is the sifting of hearts before the judgment seat when the King of Kings and Lord of Lords treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, as this day is prophesied in Isaiah and in the book of Revelation. Malachi also speaks of the trial by fire. He says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi, and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord the mighty I am presence, an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord, the mighty I am presence, as in the days of old, and as in former years. And I will come near to you to judgment, and I will be a swift witness against sorcerers, and against adulterers, and against false swearers, and against those that oppress the hireling in his wages. The widow and the fatherless, and that turn aside the stranger from his right, and fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. For I am the Lord, the I am that I am. I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob, are not consumed. The sons and daughters of God are not consumed by the trial by fire, not if they have prepared themselves for that most sacred initiation. How much of the karma of the ages of Pisces, both personal and planetary, we are required to balance before we move on to the age of Aquarius? is a question I cannot answer because it is the judgment of divine love for each of us, each of our life streams. 
What is so astounding about the Piscean Age is that we are not just accountable for the karma of the last 2,000 years. We are accountable for the personal and planetary karma of the last 25,800 years. Pisces is the end of one complete cycle of the precession of the equinoxes. The Lord God revealed this to me in a vision he gave me of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. He showed me that these four horsemen have ridden through the centuries of the Christian era. Who are the four horsemen? They are the harbingers of personal and planetary karma. They are the initiators of the soul of the planet. They provide karmic testing to everyone. The ride of the four horsemen began in 2 AD. It will conclude in the year 2002 AD. Our karma for the last 25,800 years would have descended in full at the beginning of the Piscean Age had it not been for Jesus Christ. The people of Earth were not prepared to deal with this karma. Our Father called upon his Son to incarnate on Earth. Moved with compassion concerning their plight, Jesus answered the call to bear the cross of 25,800 years of world karma for a 2,150 year period. This is why Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. By his grace, this returning karma, come full due in the age of Pisces, was mitigated. We have walked through these 2,000 years, having relative freedom to pursue good works and the mysteries of Christ, because Jesus, the Son of God, did bear that karma for us. As the Son of God bore the sins of the whole world, that karma descended in a series of cycles throughout the 2,150 years of the Piscean Age. Jesus took embodiment to show us how to walk the path of the incarnation of the Word so that we could learn how to balance our own karma. He came as the example, the teacher. This is the real meaning of the grace of Jesus Christ. Grace does not cancel out sin. It gives us opportunity to make our amends. Time and space in which to do penance for our sins, our karma. In fact, the word opportunity is a synonym for grace. Jesus bore humanity's karma for the Piscean Age from the time of his incarnation until April 23, 1969. That was the date. That date was the beginning of the dark cycle of the return of mankind's karma, April 23, 1969. On that day, Jesus' dispensation to bear the sins of the world came to a conclusion. The karma of nations and persons began to be meted out, intensifying year by year. Now it is up to the light bearers of planet Earth to be the mediators. That karma descended first through the etheric envelope of the planet, then through the mental, then through the astral plane. What we are facing today is karma returning to the physical plane. Jesus then calls upon us to be mediators. He says that we must intercede for mankind by our words and deeds by powerful prayers to Father and Son, and dynamic decrees to the Holy Spirit invoking the violet flame, by rosaries to the Blessed Virgin and Kuan Yin, and mantras to the Divine Mother. Jesus did retain the dispensation to bear the karma of those individuals who would embody the Christ light, that is, those individuals who took this opportunity of the past 2,000 years to follow in his footsteps and to prove and prove again his teachings. Therefore, to the extent that a person embodies the Christ light, Jesus can still bear a portion of his sins. Jesus also has a dispensation to assist certain souls who have the potential to embody the Christ and will do so the moment that they are connected or reconnected 
to this path and teaching that teaches them how to do it. We are then in the final 12 years of this 2,000 year ride of the Four Horsemen. What is so significant about these 12 years? Well, I'll tell you, on April 23rd, 1990, the Four Horsemen began delivering in the physical plane the karma that mankind had created in the physical plane over the last 25,800 years. This karma is a most serious challenge to everyone on the planet. As we can see from events unfolding in the Middle East, in the United States and the USSR. None of us is exempt from this karmic summing up. We have to be realists. We have to be ready to balance our accounts. We have to prepare ourselves for the trial by fire because ready or not, here it comes. That is what this lecture is all about. There have been prophecies from many sources that show we are approaching an era of major world change. The prophecies predict war, economic turmoil, and earth changes. God said he would not destroy the earth by water again. God told no other waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. The prophecies for the next 12 years deal with the element of fire. Even if we don't see the earth going up in flames, we see the possibility of nuclear war, which unleashes the most deadly fire of all, the nucleus of the atom. The 16th century French seer Nostradamus made many predictions that apply to the 20th century. A number of them describe war and possibly nuclear war. He predicts that there will be unleashed live fire, hidden death, horrible and frightful within the globes. The sky will burn, fire will approach the great new city. Commentators say the great new city may be a reference to New York. He describes the device of flying fire, a possible allusion to incoming nuclear warheads. Nostradamus prophecies have proven to be very accurate. Modern commentators have unfortunately misread some of his key quatrains, inserting their erroneous worldview into their interpretations. St. Germain has given me the correct interpretations of key quatrains that apply to the 20th century and the superpowers. I have published these in my book, St. Germain on Prophecy. I believe Nostradamus' prophecies give us a vivid description of the challenges our generation must soon face. And I believe that the spirit of prophecy that was upon Nostradamus came through the heart of Saint Germain. Another important source of prophecy are the messages of the Blessed Mother given to the three shepherd children at Fatima, Portugal in 1917 and to the young people at Medjugorje, Yugoslavia starting in 1981. Some believe that the Blessed Mother's second and third Fatima secrets foretell nuclear war, Holocaust, or at least major world changes. Mother Mary prophesied in her second secret that if Russia is not converted, she will provoke wars and different nations will be annihilated. The Blessed Mother's third secret written down by Sister Lucia, who was one of the three children, was supposed to have been revealed in 1960. But the popes never disclosed it to the public. In 1980, Pope John Paul II told a group of German Catholics that the contents of the third secret were serious. He said if there is a message in which it is said that the oceans will flood entire sections of the earth, that from one moment to the other millions of people will perish, there is no longer any point in really wanting to publish this secret message. Sister Lucia's own words on the subject give the best clues. When asked about the content of the third secret, she said, it is in the gospel and in the apocalypse. Read them. As you know, Jesus prophesies in his Olivet Discourse a great tribulation preceded by nation rising against nation, famines, pestilences, and earthquakes. At Medjugorje, Mother Mary has been warning of coming punishment for the sins of the world. Four of the youths are still receiving daily visitations and messages. One of the six visionaries says the chastisement for the world's sins can be diminished by prayer and penance but it cannot be eliminated. Commenting on what Mother Mary has revealed, she said, 
At times, I can hardly cope with it. There is also scientific evidence that the world is due for major Earth changes. One indicator is the sunspot cycle. The sunspot cycle peaks about every 11 years. Scientists believe the current cycle may have peaked in July 1989. This cycle rose faster than previous sunspot cycles. It is one of the three largest on record. Increased solar activity has been associated with climatic changes and wars. Some experts say wars tend to occur about three years after the peak of a sunspot cycle, although they occasionally occur before. Riots, battles, earthquakes, and volcanic eruptions have been charted within days or weeks of intense solar activity. On top of this, there are other cycles that indicate unstable weather throughout the decade of the 1990s, threatening the world's food supply. These include the tidal cycle of the sun, moon, and earth, the 510-year cycle of change in atmospheric conditions, and the possibility of major volcanic eruptions. If that weren't enough, we are facing man-made ecological disasters on every front. As you know, ozone depletion, acid rain, toxic waste, disappearing rainforests, and global warming could have catastrophic effects. Not to mention Saddam Hussein's dumping oil in the Gulf and torching Kuwaiti oil wells. The people of planet Earth cannot go on abusing the environment without paying the price. Edgar Cayce, America's sleeping prophet, also predicted vast earth changes. He foresaw that the earth would shift and break up in many places, especially along the North Atlantic seaboard and the coastal cities of the West. Looking to the years 2000 to 2001, he predicted that there would be upheavals causing the eruptions of volcanoes in the torrid areas and then the shifting of the poles. Cayce believed that environmental upheavals could be caused by man's own behavior he said tendencies in the hearts and souls of men could cause their own destruction. But Edgar Cayce believed prophecy could be changed. He said the activity of individuals could keep many a city and many a land intact through their application of the spiritual laws. I believe this to be absolutely true. God gives us prophecies as a warning. The prophecies tell us what will happen if we do not act in time. I believe that some prophecies can be mitigated or turned back if the people change their ways and pray for divine intercession. This is why I have published books explaining how predictions from many sources for the end of this century correlate with the prophecies of the Ascended Masters given to me by the agency of the Holy Spirit. And that is why I am so intent on delivering St. Germain's message on prophecy and its antidote, the violet flame, up and down this land. The astrological configurations of the next 12 years also tell us that we face an ascending series of karmic challenges. I compiled some of these prophecies in my book, The Astrology of the Four Horsemen. I used astrology to corroborate the prophecies given by the Ascended Masters. I believe that God has given us astrology so that we can chart our returning karma and do something about it before it's too late. On February 13, 1988, I said that in the next 12 years we would face the possibility of war, revolution, economic depression, and major earth changes. We have begun to experience all of these with the exception of major earth changes. The United States economy is in a recession. In 1989, we saw revolutions and political upheaval in Eastern Europe. We are embroiled in war in the Middle East. I also warned that throughout the next 12 years, there is a heightened chance of war between the superpowers. At the subconscious level, people know it is coming upon the earth. Many are afraid to face it. Instead of preparing for it, both spiritually and physically, they would rather escape into pleasures and pastimes even in the name of the new age. People often ask me why would I want to stay in embodiment if there is going to be a nuclear war or the earth is going to go through drastic changes. I tell them we all have physical karma that can be balanced only while we are in physical embodiment. 
You simply can't do it as a discarnate floating around. I tell them having a physical body is a priceless opportunity open to but a small percentage of souls assigned to evolve on planet Earth. What with at least 680 million bodies aborted since 1973 worldwide, we should thank our lucky stars and our parents that we are wearing these coats of skins that we wear today. If you don't resolve your karma now, you will have to re-embody and face the same people and the same situations sometime, somewhere. I believe that each of us is the temple of the living God. I believe that God placed a portion of himself within us. He has infused us with the breath of life. We have no right to allow the flame of life to be extinguished in this physical body. How do we come out on top of the events of the next 12 years? How do we rise victorious like the Phoenix? Well, we have to purge ourselves and our planet. To do this, we must first merge with the gentle violet flame of the Holy Spirit. Having saturated our four lower bodies with the violet flame and balanced a goodly portion of our karma, we may then merge with the sacred fire and emerge from the fiery furnace unscathed. The only way we can be reborn out of the ashes of the former self is if we merge with the all-consuming fire of God. When Moses beheld God face to face, he received that initiation. Whereupon he declared, Our God is a consuming fire. Likewise, we have to become the living flame. This is the path that the saints and sages of East and West have always taught. The Ascended Masters teach it today. Since the safest and simplest way to integrate with the sacred fire of God is through the step-down version of it, the violet flame, let's try it. Let's sing 70.11, which you'll find on page 8 of your booklet. You might like to stretch while we are doing this singing. Would you like to stand?
красиве. Whether you sing your decrees or speak them, you are calling forth the violet flame from the heart of God by your exercise of the science and the power of the spoken word. The violet flame is the seventh ray aspect of the Holy Spirit. The fire that descended upon the apostles on Pentecost, described in the book of Acts, manifested as cloven tongues that sat upon each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. The violet flame comes to us under the sponsorship of the Ascended Master Saint Germain, Hierarch of the Aquarian Age. I want to explain to you that the fire that descended upon the Apostles is the flame of the Holy Spirit, the white fire. It is not the violet flame. The Saint Germain's violet flame is one-seventh of that total sacred fire. Saint Germain then reintroduced the violet flame in the 20th century, not since the early days of Atlantis when its golden age civilization was at its height, have mankind had direct access to the violet flame, invoking it as you just did. Saint Germain has told us that the violet flame is a physical flame. Of all the rays that emerge from the white light, it is closest in vibratory action to the chemical elements and compounds of matter. The violet flame can combine with any particle of matter. Therefore, it is the antidote for physical problems. When you invoke the violet flame for the healing of specific problem, this is how it works. It envelops each atom of your being. A polarity is set up between the nucleus of the atom and the white fire core of the flame. The dual action of the light in the nucleus of the atom and the light in the enveloping violet flame establishes an oscillation. The oscillation causes the untransmuted densities to be dislodged from between the electrons. At non-physical or metaphysical dimensions of matter, the electrons begin to vibrate with an increased amount of energy. They literally throw the misqualified substance into the violet flame. On contact with the fiery essence of the flame, the misqualified energy is transmuted. God's energy is restored to its native purity. The alchemy takes place on what we call the material plane, but not necessarily in the objective physical plane. Every atom of substance has its counterpart in the astral, mental, and etheric compartments of the matter universe, as well as in the spiritual octaves of light. The violet flame is the key to the phoenix mystery. It is purifying and rejuvenating. By giving violet flame decrees daily, you transmute the records of karma in your four lower bodies and your subconscious mind. By this means, you can alter, mitigate, or entirely turn back the prophecy of personal and planetary karma. You realize that in the etheric double, which is a sheath of energy that surrounds your physical body, there can be read the causes of disease that may imminently manifest in your body, and there can be even identified the onset of death itself. This can be read. It is important to understand that if we use the violet flame to keep that etheric double healthy, to blaze through it, every day to consume the karma that may be cycling through us in this dark cycle, we can prevent the manifestation of disease in the physical body, untimely death or degeneration. It is important that we catch the karma before it hits the physical, because when it hits the physical body, it is the most difficult to deal with. And once that spiral sets in, such as cancer or AIDS or other diseases for which there are not cures, or some experimental cures, you find that individuals have a very difficult time fighting and most often, unless there is drastic surgery done early, in the case of cancer, these individuals wind up passing through the change called death. This is a very important gift that God gives us. The etheric double is not the etheric body. It is literally a layer of energy that surrounds the physical body and it can be read. 
When you meditate upon that layer and call upon your Holy Christ Self and your I Am Presence, you can receive the intimations of what burdens you may be carrying and what those conditions which may come upon you might be. It is very important to set aside a time, preferably before you retire, that you give your decrees and your calls for protection, and then you simply meditate upon God as you feel yourself entering into his arms as you pass into the sleep state and go out with the heavenly hosts or to the retreats of the brotherhood. When you meditate in deep meditation upon God and call upon the all-seeing eye of God for that which is hidden to be revealed, you may catch in a timely manner those untimely onsets of disease, disintegration, or old age and death that come upon people often suddenly and without warning in the physical. When you call forth the violet flame in the name of your mighty I Am Presence and Holy Christ Self, angels of the seventh ray direct the flame into centuries-old accumulations of density and discord lodged in your thinking and feeling worlds. Just as you fast for the physical body, so the violet flame is the fast for the mental body, the emotional body, and the etheric. Archangel Zadkiel has told us that the greatest step toward soul progress that any individual can ever take is the consistent and faithful use of the violet transmuting flame. He says it is the panacea for every doubt and fear. I'd like us then to give that 70.11 as a decree. It's page 8. I would like you to see the concentration of the violet flame now as a band of energy about six inches out from your form. That would represent the etheric double. So you are saturating the etheric double with violet flame. As you concentrate on the etheric double and direct into it this injection of violet flame, you can even see the violet flame as liquid flame, you then are placing your attention on that particular compartment of your world and you may develop a soul sensitivity to be able to read what is there. God has given it to you as a signpost. Everyone has faculties of the soul, sensitivities that can be developed just by training, just by listening, just by making the call for those things to come to light, to be made known in our hearts. I will offer a prayer before we give this I Am affirmation. Beloved mighty I Am Presence, beloved Holy Christ Self, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and the Divine Mother, I call for healing now to those who have gathered here in celebration of thy word and the sacred mysteries of Jesus Christ, Maitreya Gautama Sanat Kumara. Unveil to us those things that are coming upon our individual worlds and upon this planetary body. Let the sheath known as the etheric double that surrounds us now be endued with an intense and powerful transfer of light. Violet flame from the heart of Saint Germain and Portia, Zadkiel and Holy Amethyst, Arcturus and Victoria, the great divine director, beloved Kuan Yin, the five Dhyani Buddhas. We call to Om Ritas, ruler of the violet planet, 144,000 priests of the sacred fire from the heart of the violet planet. We call to Melchizedek, king of Salem and priest of the Most High God. Come forth now, ye legions of mighty Zarathustra, legions of sacred fire, legions of the violet flame, draw nigh. For we desire to be counted as the disciples of the cosmic Christ. And in manifestation in this world, we desire to be bearers of the fire, bearers of that fiery essence, O God, that we might ignite many, going forth from thy altar in thy name to quicken hearts to this moment in the ages when all must face, knowingly or unknowingly, the trial by fire. Therefore, through the immaculate heart of Mary, the sacred heart of Jesus, we affirm thy flame, O God. I am the violet flame in action in me now. 
I am the violet flame to light alone I bow. I am the violet flame in mighty cosmic power. I am the light of God shining every hour. I am the violet flame blazing like the sun. I am God's sacred power freeing every one. I am the violet flame in action in me now. I am the violet flame to light alone I bow. I am the violet flame in mighty cosmic power. I am the light of God shining every hour. I am the violet flame blazing like the sun. I am that sacred power freeing everyone. I am the violet flame in action in me now. I am the violet flame in light alone I bow. I am the violet in mighty cosmic power. I am the light of God shining every hour. I am the violet flame blazing like the sun. I am that sacred power freeing everyone. I am the violet flame in action in me now. I am the violet flame in light alone I bow. I am the violet flame in mighty cosmic power. I am the light of God shining every hour. I am the violet flame blazing like the sun. I am the sacred power freeing everyone. I am the violet flame in action in me now. I am the violet flame in light alone I bow. I am the violet flame in mighty cosmic power. I am the light of God shining every hour. I am the violet flame blazing like the sun. I am the sacred power freeing everyone. I am the violet flame in action in me now. I am the violet flame in light alone I bow. I am the violet flame in mighty cosmic power. I am the light of God shining every hour. I am the violet flame blazing like the sun. I am the sacred power freeing everyone. Let us take page 16 of this booklet. The six mighty cosmic light calls. These are like a preamble for the decree that follows on the next page, the decree for freedom's holy light. So we will give one following the other together. Unfailing light of God, I am calling your perfection into action in me now. Unfailing light of God, I am calling your perfection into action in me now. Unfailing light of God, I am calling your perfection into action in me now. Unfailing light of God, I am calling your perfection into action in this organization now. Unfailing light of God, I am calling your perfection into action in this organization now. Unfailing light of God, I am calling your perfection into action in this organization now. Unfailing light of God, I am calling your perfection into action on the earth now. Unfailing light of God, I am calling your perfection into action on the earth now. Unfailing light of God, I am calling your perfection into action on the earth now. The blazing light of God in the fullness of its power is victorious now. The blazing light of God in the fullness of its power is victorious now. The blazing light of God in the fullness of its power is victorious now. Mighty Arcturus, thou Elohim of God, descend with that light of a thousand suns to transmute all human selfishness and discord on the earth now. Mighty Arcturus, thou Elohim of God, descend with that light of a thousand suns to transmute all human selfishness and discord on the earth now. Mighty Arcturus, thou Elohim of God, descend with that light of a thousand suns to transmute all human selfishness and discord on the earth now. The light of God never fails. The light of God never fails. The light of God never fails. And the beloved mighty I am presence is that light. The light of God never fails. The light of God never fails. The light of God never fails. And the beloved mighty I am presence is that light. The light of God never fails. The light of God never fails. The light of God never fails. And the beloved mighty I am presence is that light. We speak to all misqualified energy. You have no power. Your day is done. In God's name I am be thou dissolved and transmuted into light, illumination, and love forever. We speak to all misqualified energy. You have no power. Your day is done. In God's name I am be thou dissolved and transmuted into light, illumination, and love forever. We speak to all misqualified energy. You have no power. Your day is done. In God's name I am me, thou dissolved and transmuted into light, illumination and love forever. The unlimited hosts of light now move with lightning speed around the whole world, 
and all human shadows melt away before God's love. The unlimited hosts of light now move with lightning speed around the whole world, and all human shadows melt away before God's love. The unlimited hosts of light now move with lightning speed around the whole world, and all human shadows melt away before God's love. Decree for freedom's holy light together. Mighty cosmic light, my own, I am presence bright. Proclaim freedom everywhere in order and by God control. I am making all things whole. Mighty cosmic light, stop the lawless hordes of night. Proclaim freedom everywhere in justice and in service true. I am coming, God, to you. Mighty cosmic light, I am law's prevailing might. Proclaim freedom everywhere in magnifying all goodwill. I am freedom living still. Mighty cosmic light, now make all things right. Proclaim freedom everywhere in love's victory all shall go. I am the wisdom all shall know. I am freedom's holy light, nevermore despairing. I am freedom's holy light, evermore I'm sharing. Freedom, 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 expand, expand, expand. I am, I am, I am, forevermore I am freedom. Mother Mary said in a dictation given through me in 1984 that if tens of thousands of people gave the violet flame decrees daily, the change on earth would be so phenomenal that not only would you wonder where the problems went, you would forget that you ever had any problems. Since we are in an age of transition, this is an alchemical moment. What you do right now with your life will determine your fate for the next 2,000 years and more. You need to sow good seed in fallow ground in this decade. What you accomplish today on your spiritual path and in your life's calling will determine the quality of your ashes. Make your peace with yourself, your God, and your friends and enemies. Use the violet flame as an adjunct to your daily service to life. It's the real way to heal yourself and planet Earth. Use it to literally burn up selfishness, self-concern, addictions, appetites, covetousness, callousness. The violet flame is the real way to balance your karma, freeing your soul to integrate with the presence of God. The violet flame is the real way to get where you need to go. Try it. It will work for you if you work it by the science of the spoken word you just exercised. I'd like us to sing on page 19, Light Set Me Free. You're welcome to stand for this. If you know it, you can stretch your arms and feel the great flow of the great fire breath coming into you.
please be seated. The violet flame is the key to the heart of the five Dhyani Buddhas. The Dhyani Buddhas are great cosmic beings from starry heights. Their assistance to you on your path is invaluable. Although they have never embodied on earth, the five Dhyani Buddhas have recently come closer to earth than ever before in response to an increasing fervor of the devotees who invoke their intercession. In Tibetan Buddhism, it is taught that the wisdoms of the five Dhyani Buddhas counteract or antidote the five poisons that are of ultimate danger to the soul's spiritual progress. The presence of any one of these five poisons in the psyche can cause the individual to fail the test of the trial by fire. There is Vairoshana. The meaning of his name is he who is like the sun. His wisdom is the all-pervading wisdom of the Dharmakaya, your great causal body and I am presence. The poison antidoted by his wisdom is the poison of ignorance. Akshobhya, his name means the immovable, the imperturbable. His wisdom is the mirror-like wisdom, the mirror-like wisdom that mirrors the mind of God in your heart. The poison antidoted by his wisdom is the poison of anger, hate, and hate creation. There is Ratna Sambhava, his name is the jewel-born one, or origin of jewels. His wisdom is the wisdom of equality. The poison antidoted by his wisdom is the poison of spiritual, intellectual, and human pride. Amitabha, his name means infinite light. His wisdom is discriminating wisdom. The poisons antidoted by his wisdom are the poisons of the passions, all cravings, covetousness, greed, and lust. Amoga City, his name is Almighty Conqueror, he who unerringly achieves his goal. His wisdom is the all-accomplishing wisdom, or the wisdom of perfected action. The poisons antidoted by his wisdom are the poisons of envy and jealousy. The mudras of the five Dhyani Buddhas are included in the mudras that we use with Padma Sambhava's golden mantra. Vajrasattva is the divine being who is believed to be the essence and integration of all five Dhyani Buddhas. Vajrasattva is called a Buddha by some, a Bodhisattva by others. He represents the principle of purity and purification. He embodies the quintessence of the diamond nature. He can eliminate all spiritual impurities. His name means diamond being or the indestructible minded one. His wisdom is the wisdom of the diamond will of God. He antidotes the poisons of non-will and non-being, fear, doubt, and non-belief in God, the great guru. The trial by fire that takes place as you accelerate spiritually involves first the highest vibrating of the four lower bodies, the etheric body, it is also called the fire body. When purified, it becomes a chalice of the body of Christ and the body of the I am that I am. Some years ago, the ascended master Lanello told us that we must strive for the purification of the etheric body. You can see that this is a very key reason why we should purify that etheric body because then the Christ will draw nigh to us and enter that temple of fire and so will the I Am Presence. To proceed with the ongoing initiations of the trial by fire, you must establish an equilibrium amongst your four lower bodies, as these are the four sides of the pyramid of being, and denote the four elements, fire, air, water, and earth. When I look at a statue of Gautama Buddha, or the Lord himself at inner levels, I observe the phoenix fire mystery in process perpetually. I see a conflagration enveloping him at inner levels. It is the fire enfolding itself that was seen by Ezekiel. And he is the fire within the fire. The fire of God is streaming forth from his chakras. Beloved Gautama's being is in a state of perpetual transformation. Every moment there is a new Buddha there. Every moment a Buddha is materializing 
and a Buddha is dematerializing. The 17th century Saint Margaret Mary describes how Jesus once appeared to her with flames streaming from every part of his body, especially his bosom. She said his bosom resembled an open furnace. Inside the furnace she saw his heart, which was the source of the flames. The teachings of El Moria speak of the yoga of sacred fire, Agni, Agni Yoga, as the coming yoga, the yoga of the coming age. In the 1920s, Nicholas and Helena Rorick began releasing the teachings of El Moria and other masters of the Great White Brotherhood through the Agni Yoga books. Nicholas was a renowned and prolific artist, archaeologist, and author. Helena wrote extensively on the esoteric tradition of Eastern religion. From her book, Heart, we read, Even the highest beings must become a flame in spirit in order to act. The expression to become a flame is truly exact. Precisely, one must become a flame. This means that one must fill oneself with an abundance of the spirit. I would like to tell you apropos this quote that when you reach a certain level on the path of spirituality, unless you become a flame in that moment and ever thereafter, you may suffer setback and disaster in your life. It is impossible to retain and manifest a certain level of spirituality without acquaintance with the fire. Helena Rorick goes on to say, this means that one must fill oneself with an abundance of the spirit. But does it not signify that one must enter into contact with hierarchy? Hierarchy is composed of those beings, ascended masters, archangels, heavenly hosts, the saints robed in white, all of whom have one thing in common. They have merged with fire. There comes a day in your life when nothing else will do but establishing that definite contact with Saint Gabriel the Archangel, one of the saints of God with Jesus Christ. And when I say contact, I mean a linking, a strong bond of the heart, a strong tie that you nourish daily by daily devotions, by giving the rosary and giving the Hail Mary with a sense of the enveloping presence of the Blessed Mother. If you are seeking and have sought everywhere else in every other activity that involves phenomena instead of the inner unfolding of the flame, you can now understand where you have not found what you have been thirsting for. You are thirsting for the living flame and to know how to assimilate that body and blood of Christ so that you become it. Nothing less will satisfy your soul and anything else will take you on the byways and the dead ends and the routes that do not lead to that place of the holy city. Only in drawing the spirit from the highest source, hierarchy, do we receive renewal and the tensity of the fiery energy. Hence, it is not indicated anywhere that one must isolate oneself in spirit on the contrary, one must fill oneself with the power of the Spirit, which leads to light. I can hail you, mighty warriors who are aware of the phoenix rising from the ashes. That is the end of that quote of Helena Rorick. In her book, Agni Yoga, we learn that the rewards of the yoga of fire demand a constant and fiery striving. Not ascetics, not fanatics, not the superstitious, but those who know the yoga of fire are the ones who will not abandon the rudders of life. Truly, their sacrifice will be great. They will be constantly on the rim of explosion, although they could have calmly continued their existence. But rest is not a property of fire, for fire constantly destroys something in order to create. Such fiery strivings test the sensations as in a crucible. Pure striving will produce the flashes of fire. The teaching of Agni Yoga demands continuous ardor. 
Sometimes rest from manifestations is needed, but the inner flame is inextinguishable. One should be accustomed to the manifestation of constant fire. Our flame burns like a bonfire. It is unworthy to impede it. Some of the young may ask, how should one understand Agni Yoga? Say, as the perception and application in life of the all-embracing element of fire, which nourishes the seed of the spirit. He will ask, how can I approach that knowledge? Say, purify your thoughts, and after determining your three worst defects, sacrifice them to be burned in a fiery striving. Properly speaking, where there is fire, there is evidence of progressive perfection. And the corollary to that is, where there is an absence of fire, there is evidence of non-progressive perfection. There is no progress without fire. This is what the path of the saints is all about. Those who do not internalize the sacred fire, for they have not bent the knee before our God who is a consuming fire, experience the fire as stress. It is easy to get into stress instead of into fire. Most of us can equate with a sense of stress in our spiritual path daily, having to solve the economics of life, being at work, and demanding hours, demanding performance. Then we know the stress. This is something we must learn to deal with, with fire. What happens then to those who do not bend the knee before the, the God who is that fire? They seek to escape both the fire and the stress by getting away from it all. Those who experience fire as fire learn to internalize it through interludes of meditation, communion with the Earth Mother, yoga, breathing exercises, devotions, decrees, or physical activities that balance and quicken the organs. Other methods that stimulate the assimilation of fire in the four lower bodies are listening to classical or religious music, engaging in rhythmic and creative activities, raising the kundalini, even deep sleep during which you take leave of the body temple for service with the heavenly hosts on the etheric plane. Work itself is a means of assimilation of fire. What is most important is the rhythm of change, the rhythm of recreation, rather just more and more recreation, recreation of the self. El Moria's heart, head, and hand decrees are one of the keys you can use to accelerate the fire in your chakras. As you know, El Moria is our beloved guru who founded the Summit Lighthouse through Mark Prophet in Washington, D.C. in 1958. In the early years of the activity, El Moria dictated to Mark the heart, head, and hand decrees. El Moria said he wanted them to be simple and concise. They celebrate the major steps everyone must go through to make his ascension. Each section corresponds to one of the chakras. You might want to write your name in your booklet and mark on the heart, head, and hand decrees that start on page three, which decree corresponds to which chakra and which ray. The heart, head, and hand, that is the first page, applies to the heart chakra and the third ray. Heart chakra and third ray on the first page. The tube of light corresponds to the secret chamber of the heart, the eighth ray. The forgiveness decree corresponds to the seat of the soul chakra, the seventh ray. The supply decree corresponds to the third eye, the fifth ray. The fifth ray is the green ray. The seventh ray that goes under forgiveness is the violet ray.
When we say the tube of light is the eighth ray, we're talking about the white light. And when we talk about the decrees on the first page, page three, we're talking about the third ray, which is pink. So then you go on to page five, and you see the decree that calls for perfection. Perfection is on the first ray, that ray is blue, and the chakra is the throat chakra. Then you come to the transfiguration. The transfiguration has to do with the opening and the exaltation of the light in the crown chakra. It is the second ray. The color is yellow or golden. The resurrection comes about when you have purified your desiring. O oh, Jesus, joy of our desiring. When our desiring is to desire the will of God, which can be very joyous and happy for you, can be the very things that you do desire in life. When you resist the non-will of God, the forces of the anti-will, you begin to experience the resurrection flame in the solar plexus chakra, and that is the sixth ray of purple and gold with ruby flecks. Finally, the decree for the ascension. We are at the base chakra, the white light, and the fourth ray. So, so again, this is the white light of the Divine Mother. These decrees touch on every initiation and every plane of your being. They are the most scientific gift of beloved El Moria to each one of us. Sometimes we take these decrees for granted or only give the violet flame section. You should make it your business as a career son or daughter of God to give them daily, three times each, is sufficient. You will then be touching all of the initiations you will deal with in this life, all the karma you will be dealing with, and you will be unfolding the light in your seven chakras. There is no single set of decrees that I know of that accomplishes so much as this group of decrees. The trial by fire is an initiation that comes to everyone. Listen to the words of the Apostle Paul as they outline the tests of the trial by fire you will face in this life. Other foundation can no man lay that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. The trial by fire is not simply karmic initiation, although in some of its aspects it is delivered through returning personal and planetary karma, as I have said. The trial by fire is an initiation that takes place when an individual is ready to shed the snakeskin of the former self and is simultaneously able to receive an increase in the fire in his chakras, an increase in the light of the heart and a greater balancing of his threefold flame. This is the Phoenix mystery. The trial by fire comes to an individual when he can withstand the purging that is necessary, necessary to receive a greater increment of fire in his being. The goal of the devotee passing through the trial by fire is to become permanently endowed with sacred fire and fused to his holy Christ self. 
Prior to arriving at the point of this initiation, the devotee on the path may day by day balance karma, invoke the violet flame and serve life growing in grace and in the wisdom of the mysteries of Christ. When he has showed himself approved unto God as a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, when he has fulfilled the requirements of discipleship and magnetized the love of God in his being, he will reach the moment when he is ready for the trial by fire. The trial by fire is entered into by those who love God with the full fervor of their being. Only those who love God with all their heart and soul and mind and their neighbor as themselves have the courage to pass through the gates of the trial by fire. They are willing to bear the cross of this initiation in order to receive the crown of everlasting life. When such a devotee emerges from this experience, which may take days, weeks, or lifetimes, he is consumed with a desire to convey to other souls, drop by drop and cup by cup, portions of that fire which he has now become. At this point in his career, we find Jesus at the Last Supper saying to his disciples, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This is my blood of the New Testament. Drink ye all of it. Earlier, Jesus had told his disciples, Except ye eat the flesh and drink the blood of the Son of Man, ye have no life in you. From this we understand that the definition of life is having the light of Alpha and Omega within our temple, within our four lower bodies. Those who are with life and those who are without life we can see that it is determined by that portion of fire that you have focused in your temple. This is the phoenix, consuming and consumed by the living flame of love. The Christ gives of his life essence, his body and his blood, now charged with the light of Alpha and Omega. He is preparing all who will follow him in the regeneration for their trial by fire and crucifixion unto the victory of their soul's union with God. The initiation of the trial by fire may precede or be concurrent with the crucifixion, but it must be accomplished before the individual can enter the initiations of the transfiguration, the resurrection, and the ascension. These three initiations are gradually making permanent by increment the fire of one's being. The transfiguration and resurrection transmit increments of sacred fire until the final trial, the ascension, when the soul is assimilated unto the I am that I am. The imagery of the trial by fire has come down to us in two very graphic stories. One in the Hindu epic, the Ramayan, and the other in the Old Testament. The Ramayan recounts the adventures of the hero Ram, or as it is said in English, Rama, the, se the seventh incarnation of the Hindu god Vishnu. Deprived of his rightful kingship, Ram is forced into a long exile with his wife Sita. During their exile, Sita is abducted by the demon king Ravan. She is forced to live in the evil king's house. Ram vows to annihilate his enemy and commands the intervention of heaven. He wages a mighty war and rescues his beloved. Swami Prabhavananda summarizes the next episode from the Ramayan. Quote, in the very moment of their triumph, Ram and Sita had to face a new ordeal. Murmurs were heard among their followers touching Sita's virtue. How do we know, they questioned, that Sita continued pure during all the time she lived in the household of the demon king? To this, Ram replied simply, Sita is purity and chastity itself. But the complaints of the people were not stilled. We want the test, they cried. Finally, to meet their demand, 
Sita plunged into sacrificial fire. No sooner did this happen than from out the flames there rose up the god of fire himself, bearing on his head a throne, and there seated upon the throne was the slandered Sita unharmed. Hindu lore calls this Sita's ordeal by fire. Her virtue and purity sealed her from harm. The light and fire already in her aura was her saving grace. Now we turn to ancient Israel and the fiery trial of the three Hebrew youths taken into captivity by the Babylonians. The book of Daniel tells the story that the three youths, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, refused to fall down and worship a pagan image. The Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar, arrested them and cast them into a fiery furnace. When the king looked into the furnace, he was astounded to see the youths unscathed. Not only that, but he saw four figures instead of three walking in the midst of the fire. He said the form of the fourth is like unto the Son of God. The king bid the youth step out of the furnace. Not a hair of their head was singed, nor did they smell of smoke. The king issued a decree prohibiting any of his subjects to speak against the Hebrew God. The ascended master Rex has lifted the veil on the karmic record of this event. In a dictation delivered in October 1989, Rex said that in that episode he was the fourth figure the king saw in the furnace and that he was overshadowed by the Son of God. Rex revealed that the reason he and the three Hebrews had to undergo the initiation in the fiery furnace was that in a previous life they had stoned Enoch while he knelt in prayer. From the moment of his stoning, Enoch became their sponsor, profoundly praying for them. For many lifetimes, they received initiations under Enoch's sponsorship in preparation for the time when they would be required to undergo the trial by fire in the physical octave. The trial in the fiery furnace was the way they could receive back, measure for measure, their serious karma for the persecution of Enoch. That fiery trial was also the consuming of that karma. Rex said the reason he and the three youths remained untouched by the fire was that their chakras were balanced and they had immersed themselves in the service of God. Rex told us to remember in the hour of our own trial by fire that we too have received much preparation. But he said if you have not been quickened by the Holy Spirit and if you have not quickened yourself to your Christhood and your I am presence, you may come to that trial by fire not fully prepared and therefore suffer loss and pay the penalty. I would like to point out to you that the story concerning John the Beloved is that when he was in his 90s, he was boiled in oil. He emerged from that being boiled in oil to go to Patmos and to write down the book of the Revelation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, which is the book that is the final book of the New Testament. This is the amazing love of the Savior Jesus Christ that John the Beloved had in his aura. John the Beloved was the embodiment of the living flame of love, and because he had that in his aura, his aura provided the bridge even as Jesus placed his electronic presence over him in the dictating of this wondrous book that Christians have studied for 2,000 years as a prophecy of things to come to pass. Then there was the 16th century mystic and poet, Saint John of the Cross. There is a record of his experience of the soul's trial by fire in his spiritual treaties. Saint John founded the discalced, meaning barefoot Carmelites in Spain. He served primarily as an administrator, but the thing he liked to do most was spiritual counseling. St. John says that the goal of spiritual life is union with God through the living flame of love. This union is thwarted by the voluntary inordinate appetites of the soul. He calls the soul's journey leading to union with God the dark night. During the dark night, the soul is purged by the same light with which it seeks to be united. Remember the phoenix mystery. The phoenix is consumed by the same fire 
from which he emerges reborn. St. John writes, before the divine fire is introduced into and united to the substance of the soul through a person's perfect and complete purg purgation and purity, its flame, which is the Holy Spirit, wounds it by destroying and consuming the imperfections of its bad habits. That is exactly what the violet flame of the Holy Spirit does. It destroys and consumes, we say that it transmutes, the imperfections of our bad habits. St. John says that same flame also bathes the soul in glory and refreshes it with the quality of divine life. John compares God's purging fire of love to the fire that penetrates the log of wood. The fire first makes an assault upon the wood, wounding it with its flame, drying it out and stripping it of its unsightly qualities. By heating and enkindling it from without, the fire transforms the wood into itself and makes it as beautiful as it is itself. Imperfections are the fuel which catches on fire, and once they are gone, there is nothing left to burn. So it is here on earth. When the imperfections are gone, the soul's suffering terminates and joy remains. What do you experience when you are saturated with a violet flame? Joy. Nothing but joy upon joy. St. John described two kinds of dark nights according to what he understood as the two parts of the soul, sensory and spiritual. The Ascended Masters teach that the dark night of the soul is the soul's encounter with the return of personal karma. If the soul has not kept her chakras filled with light, the dark night may eclipse the light of the soul and its discipleship under Jesus Christ. The dark night of the soul precedes the initiation of the dark night of the spirit. The dark night of the spirit is the supreme test of Christhood. The soul is, as it were, cut off from the I Am Presence. It must survive solely on the light garnered in the heart, while holding the balance for planetary karma. Souls on earth are going through these initiations today, ill-equipped, ill-prepared. The timing of these initiations at the end of 25,800 years is now disregarding the state of the souls on the planet. All are going through these tests. Describing the activity of the Holy Spirit in the soul transformed by love, St. John writes that the flame of love of the Holy Spirit causes the soul to burn up in the fire of love. So intense is this burning that the soul is seemingly consumed in that flame and the fire makes it go out of itself, wholly renews it, and changes its manner of being, as in the case of the phoenix, which burns itself in the fire and rises anew from the ashes. David said in this regard, my heart was inflamed and my reins have been changed. Reins is a word for kidneys and in general for other organs. So it is the purging of the organs of the body, purged of karmic records. Our records lodge in our organs, which, why, which is why our organs become diseased, because it is the outpicturing of karma. Now I was reading the quote from St. John of the Cross when he spoke about the phoenix. He was writing of that mystery and that legend. St. John says the appetites and affections which the prophet refers to as reigns are all changed to divine ones in that inflammation of the heart. Inflammation. If you do not feel a burning in your heart and in your chakras the way the disciples did on the road to Emmaus, you can pray to Jesus to superimpose his sacred heart over your heart. Your heart should be literally a fiery cauldron that consumes personal karma, world karma, world pain, and suffering. In the joy of Saint John of the Cross, John the Beloved, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, in the very great joy of those who have passed through this trial, let us give I am the light of the heart, page 26. This is a marvelous mantra by Saint Germain. I suggest you memorize it 
and give it. Give it mentally as you walk about the streets of life. We spend so much time coming and going, waiting, waiting for the pot to boil, waiting to complete tasks here and there. We can either out loud or in our minds be reciting our favorite mantra. This is wondrous, and therefore see your I am presence now focusing the light in your heart together. I am the light of the heart, shining in the darkness of being and changing all into the golden treasury of the mind of Christ. I am projecting my love out into the world to erase all errors, to break down all barriers. I am the power of infinite love, amplifying itself until it is victorious, world without end. I am the light of the heart, shining in the darkness of being and changing all into the golden treasury of the mind of Christ. I am projecting my love out into the world to erase all errors and to break down all barriers. I am the power of infinite love, amplifying itself until it is victorious, world without end. I am the light of the heart, shining in the darkness of being, and changing all into the golden treasury of the mind of Christ. I am projecting my love out into the world to erase all errors and to break down all barriers. I am the power of infinite love, amplifying itself until it is victorious, world without end.